Hello to everybody. This is Jeremy Grimshaw. Um, delighted to be giving this seminar as part of the Gessie uh, Cotton Learning uh, series. Um, also delighted that I'm sharing the uh, presentation today with Kristen Danko. Um, I'm sitting in a warm um, Beirut where it's uh, plus 19 degrees. And Kristen, I think, is sitting in Ottawa where, according to my phone, it's minus one degree. So I, I think I, I win um, today. <laughs> Um, so, what we're going to do is, 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 is talk a little bit about systematic reviews of complex interventions, describe work that we've done in the past and some of the frustrations we had about trying to apply traditional systematic review and meta-regression approaches to complex intervention reviews. And then Christine is going to talk about some uh, recent work that uh, we're doing, that she's doing as part of her PhD, which is exploring uh, more innovative analytical models to see if we can get more more information out of uh, complex interventions or systematic reviews. Um, so you'll see on the slide, we also identify a number of other co-authors who've been very central to developing this work, and I'll mention them shortly. Uh, the work is funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research and also Diabetes Canada, and we're very grateful for their support. Uh, we have a very broad team, um, um, but the four people across the top are the, uh, uh, the people who probably who are probably most central to the work we're going to discuss today. Kristen Danko, who you'll hear shortly. Noah Ivers, who's an academic family practitioner in uh, uh, Toronto and Canada. Issa Dabrana, um, and Tom Tricolinus from the Brown uh, uh, um, Systematic Review Group. Um, and then we have a, a very wide um, um, group of, of collaborators, who, some of whom are systematic review scientists and some of whom are, are knowledge users. So, um, we're talking a little bit about complex interventions uh, and whoop, there we go. Uh, um, when we've when systematic reviews were first used in, in medicine is often they're often used to try and synthesize um, um, information on the effects of, of drug interventions. Uh, where to some extent, um, although there's still complexity in those reviews, uh, the interventions were relatively straightforward. You had to design, uh, define the drug and maybe the dose, maybe the route, but there wasn't a huge amount of complexity around that. However, as, as, um, uh, as time has advanced, we're now using systematic review approaches to, uh, uh, to try and synthesize evidence on very complex uh, health system or public health interventions. And these, um, uh, uh, these usually involve uh, um, several interacting components. Um, um, and uh, this box just get from the UK MRC talks a little bit about what makes intervention complex. Um, it could be that there are a number of interactions between components in both the experimental and control arms. It could be about the number and difficulty of behaviors requiring by those delivering or receiving the intervention, number of groups or organization levels targeted by the intervention, variability in outcomes, and degree of flexibility of tailoring of the intervention permitted. And as we move from relatively simple interventions to more complex interventions, um, this raises a number of, of both conceptual and methodological issues that uh, systematic reviewers have to consider. For this presentation, we want to use an example of a series of systematic reviews of diabetes quality improvement strategies uh, that we've been conducting for over a decade. So the first time we published uh, um, on this was in 2006 in JAMA. Uh, at that point in time, we identified 50 randomized controlled trials. Uh, the next time we published was in The Lancet in 2012, and at that time we identified 142 trials um, published by um, um, 2010. So in effect, we've been a traveling of the literature within a, a very um, short uh, uh, time frame, um, and this rapid trajectory of the, of the literature and the large number of studies potentially offers us um, interesting and innovative way opportunities to uh, try different analytical approaches. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the, the Lancet review and the kind of challenges it raised for us. And then um, Kristen will take over with a, a, a basically a, a discussion of what, we, what we've been trying to do since then. So within the Lancet review, we were interested in uh, the effects of 12 different quality improvement interventions. And normally what we found is it wasn't that, you know, that these interventions uh, often coincided. So it was very rare to find a, a study of one intervention versus control. Normally you'd have different combinations of interventions. So you could have audit and feedback and case management versus control, case management, clinician education and patient education versus patient education. And so what we had were basically um, uh, 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 packages of quality improvement interventions that were made up of different uh, uh, different combinations of these interventions. 
Um, we also are interested in a broad range of, of outcomes of interest. Diabetes is a, a complex disease and there are many different sort of um, um, targets that we try to improve when you're managing diabetes. But for day, today's presentation, we're going to largely talk about uh, HbA1c measurement. This is a measurement of how well um, the patient's blood pressure, uh, sorry, blood sugar um, levels are being controlled. Uh, when we did the, the Lancet review, um, we screened um, approximately five and a half thousand titles and abstracts published between 2005 and 2011. Um, we ended up with uh, um, uh, uh, looking at over 2,000 uh, full text articles, and this just highlights some complex interventions that you often don't have enough information in the uh, abstract and uh, 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 title to um, address glue studies uh, uh, on, on, on those alone. Uh, and we ended up with um, um, 162 studies. Uh, or 162 papers that uh, uh, basically reported data from 142 randomized controlled trials. Uh, there were 48 plus randomized trials and 94 patient randomized trials. And together, um, there were more than two and a half thousand clusters with over 80 or around 85,000 patients in the cluster trials and uh, 38,000 included in the nine uh, patients included in the 94 patient randomized trials. Now, in virtually any other setting, uh, if you had that amount of data, you would think that we could answer any possible question. Um, you know, in general, systematic reviews have a much smaller number of studies and a much smaller number of patients. So this amount of information surely would allow us to ask, answer the questions uh, uh, with great um, precision. Um, that was that was our hope. So we, I'm going to present sort of. Um, a number of different analyses. One of the challenges of, of um, doing these reviews where you have these uh, multi-component interventions that don't neatly fall out into intervention versus control is how you do analyze them. And we try to do two different approaches. In this slide, what we did is we basically did a, a straightforward meta-analysis where we compared any studies that had a certain intervention with all other studies. So, for example, there were 60 randomized controlled trials that included promotion of self-management. So we compared those 60 trials uh, of self-management to the 60 trials who did, uh, where self-management wasn't present. Um, what you can see um, is that across all of the different interventions that we have, um, everything seems to be you know, potentially effective, apart from um, potentially financial uh, um, uh, 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 um, incentives and continuous quality improvement, uh, where we really have too few studies to, to say anything concretely about them. You'll also see that the confidence intervals tend to overlap. Um, so what this suggests is that you know, everything works, and it's very hard to actually sort of make any conclusions about whether certain interventions are likely more effective or less effective than others. So the bottom line of this sort of analysis is that if you do something, then you'll probably improve glycemic control, which is not a very helpful uh, um, um, answer for decision makers who want to know in my context, for within our sort of healthcare setting where we have these resources and these patient characteristics, what are the best interventions that would uh, help us improve uh, glycemic control at the population level. The next level of, a, of, a, of the next analysis we did was a meta regression. And here, what we try and do is we, uh, we, we correct for the presence or absence of uh, uh, um, other co-interventions. So um, um, again, and, and we dropped out the, uh, the financial incentives and quality improvement interventions. So we only had 117 trials in this analysis and there were 15 trials of, of um, and promotion self-management. And when we sort of looked at the effects of those, tried to correct for um, team check or, or the other interventions, we found that um, um, it had a reduction of about 0.45 uh, 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 of a percentage of hemoglobin A1C. Um, again, you can see that all interventions seem to have a beneficial effect. And again, all the confidence intervals tended to be wide and overlapping. So even in this, even though this analysis tries to um, correct for the presence of co-interventions, uh, um, it, it really doesn't get as much beyond uh, where we were with the um, with, with our original meta-analysis, and certainly not the level of information that decision makers um, potentially would uh, uh, um, would be interested in. Uh, one of the things we also wanted to do is explore um, whether certain factors were effect modifiers. So what we were able to do is actually look at trials where the initial glycolated uh, 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 hemoglobin was greater than 8.0, and these would be um, trials done in populations of patients who in general had poor um, diabetic control. 
or whether the original um, um, HbA1c was less than eight, where we'd have patients who had reasonable uh, uh, reasonable control. And in this slide, what we have is we've got um, you know, three columns. So this is just basically the data we already presented uh, from the, the sort of meta-analysis. And then this were the data, um, if we just looked at uh, uh, um, patients who had, were poorly controlled or patients who were well controlled. And I want you just to look at the ranking rather than the sort of uh, uh, the actual data. You can see the promotion of self-management was the most effective intervention when we looked across all studies. Um, but actually, uh, team changes was more it was the most effective when we were uh, um, interested in poorly controlled patients. Uh, um, and uh, when we were looking at um, well-controlled patients, facilitated relay, which was a, an intervention where patients might um, send uh, information to their uh, physicians and nurses on their, on their control and get um, direct feedback from them. So, so what we have, what we can see is that depending on the baseline um, uh, 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 control, different type of interventions are more likely to be um, uh, effective and beneficial. Uh, and this potentially is becoming more useful for decision makers because it does allow people to say, okay, we're working with a population who in general are well controlled. What are the best things we can do for those patients? Or our, our patients are not well controlled. What can we do for them? So, so this seemed as though it was a helpful, um, a, a, a sort of helpful clarification. Um, but again, even if you look at this, there's a lot of overlap in the confidence intervals, and we really sort of, you know, um, although we're getting some ideas about what uh, uh, what might be effective under certain circumstances, probably insufficient to really meet the uh, detailed questions of different decision makers. Um, so, just in, in broad uh, a, a broad uh, summary of the uh, Lancet review, um, QI interventions led to about a 0.33% reduction in HbA1c, and large effects were identified with poor baseline control. Um, all effects, all interventions appeared to be effective, but we could identify some that had large effects. Um, but it's really difficult to disentangle the optimal combination of interventions. And when I went to present this to, um, uh, for example, the provincial uh, Ontario diabetes strategy, um, you know, they would often ask more pointed questions about, well, you know, under what circumstances team change, which could be an expensive intervention, you know, would, would maximally benefit, uh, benefit patients. So what I'd like to suggest is that this review provides a great study in the challenges of doing um, systematic reviews of complex interventions uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, complex intervention programs are usually, com are usually complex, involving multifaceted approaches that may contain a mixture of effective and ineffective or even harmful uh, um, components, KT and QI interventions. Uh, these components may or may not be interdependent and they may or may not interact synergistically or antagonistically. And really what we'd like to do to help decision makers is identify the, more, the most effective and ineffective, the effective and ineffective components from the program uh, to allow them to make decisions uh, considering things like sustainability and replication. Uh, the second challenge is that um, yeah, the effects of these programs are likely modified by poorly recognized and ill-defined contextual factors, making judgments about the applicability of the effects of interventions in different contexts more challenging. So in general, um, basically our, uh, uh, our, our, our traditional meta-analysis approach is we're trying to estimate the average effect of uh, these interventions across studies. Um, without yeah, ignoring the effect modification of contextual factors, which is what often health system decision makers are really interested in when they're trying to assess the applicability of their results of a systematic review um, um, to their context. So having a sort of an average effect with a very wide confidence interval doesn't particularly help a, a, a decision maker saying, in my setting, with primary care organized this way, with relatively few um, diabetic resources in the community, what would be beneficial for them? The third area is that um, mechanisms of action of these KT and QI programs uh, um, are often poorly understood. And one of the implications of this is that we, we have a poor consensus about the terminology. Um, a colleague of mine, Susan Meeke, has a wonderful slide where she puts up uh, basically the, um, um, the description of nicotine replacement therapy, which she writes as a chemical formula. And then she also talks about, uh, or then she also tries to provide descriptions of uh, and the smoking counseling programs where um, we end up ending talking about uh, uh, the intervention in much more naturalistic and poorly described uh, um, um, language. Uh, 
and it's, it's much more variable. When you're faced with this as a systematic reviewer, you often develop pragmatic uh, and I would argue rather arbitrary definitions of what programs and interventions of, of interest are. Um, and the danger with this is that we may end up misclassifying interventions. Um, so we may uh, um, add to noise in a meta-analysis if we uh, increase the observed heterogeneity by uh, including studies of different programs. Um, but we might also reduce precision if we artificially exclude studies that evaluate the same program from a comparison. So there's a real challenge about trying to make sense of these complex interventions uh, uh, and trying to make sure that we are, when we're doing a systematic review, uh, including like interventions uh, in, your, in our analysis and we're excluding uh, unlike interventions. The final challenge is that as with all systematic reviews, these issues are exacerbated by the poor reporting of interventions and contextual factors in primary studies. Um, so that um, often with these complex interventions, you may find if you're lucky a paragraph and a half description is describing what was done in a setting potentially over a, uh, you know, over a three to five year period. Um, and you really are sort of trying to um, look through through the mist to try and understand what, uh, what interventions are actually testing. So the re results of these four key challenges um, uh, is that we should, as systematic review authors, expect substantial heterogeneity within syntheses of KTO and QI programs. Uh, and in, uh, when we face that, um, uh, or in such cases, estimating the average effect of interventions is often inadequate. What we're pro more interested in is understanding the source of the complexity and how they modify the effects of the intervention of interest so that when a decision maker is describing their setting, their kind of current levels of provision of diabetes care, we can give them a much more informed um, um, information about whether uh, um, um, a particular intervention or component is likely to be beneficial. So it's actually, it was actually at the end of the Lancet uh, review remarkably frustrating. We'd in fact spent about two to three years doing this piece of work, had a, done a system of 140 trials with more than 120,000 patients in them, and ended up saying to decision makers, in general, if you do something to try and improve diabetes quality, you will improve diabetes quality, but unable to answer the questions they had. So a key question then that we, uh, we wanted to um, uh, 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 explore is, can we do better? If we can't get more useful information out of a systematic review of 142 trials, it would suggest either we're doing the primary studies very wrong, or also that our methods of systematic reviews are not particularly helpful, or more likely a combination of both of those. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to um, uh, um, Kristen Danko, who is uh, um, completing her PhD at the University of Ottawa. And her PhD is very much focusing upon how do we um, or, or can we get more information out of these complex intervention um, um, reviews? 